Okay, if I asked you to draw a continuous function on a closed interval, you could have m many different uh, pictures to represent that. It may look like something like this. It could be something like that. Or it could be many different things. Maybe it looks something like that looks a lot like my first one. The point is in all three of these, so here's going to be my closed interval, a to b, a to b, a to b. What is true is that in every one of these uh, pictures, I have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. In this graph right here, my absolute maximum is at that point. That's my absolute max and my absolute minimum is at this point. In this picture, I have my absolute maximum value of my function is that y and it occurs at two different points and then I have an absolute minimum at that point. And on this one I have an absolute max here and an absolute min there. But in all cases I had an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum for my graphs. Now the conditions that I had here were that I was on a closed interval from A to B and that my function was continuous. So let's look at this function. Let's, let's change some of those conditions and see why we don't necessarily have an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum if we do so. So first of all, let's remove the fact that it's on a closed interval. So maybe it's defined all the way uh, between A and B but not necessarily at A and B. So I might have something like this. stop it right there. Now if you look at this function, or the graph of this function, it does indeed have an absolute maximum, but there is no absolute minimum. We, if we would like it to be right here, the function evaluated at A, but as you can see it's not defined at A. So maybe we think, well it's right above there. Well what is right above there? Because any distance away from A you make, you hit a Y value, but there is still one underneath it slower, lower, and lower, and lower, and we never actually get to this value. So this graph right here does not have an absolute minimum, and that is because this function is not defined on a closed interval. That's not to say that if it's not defined on a closed interval, it doesn't have an absolute minimum. It just doesn't necessarily guarantee it. Now, let's just remove, we'll put it back to a closed interval, a to b, but this time we will remove continuity. So perhaps I'm going to have this asymptote right here. So maybe I'm defined this way. And then that way. And as you can see from this picture, I am defined on the closed interval, except not at this value right here, and my function is not continuous. So here, I don't have an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum. So if these conditions are met, I will have an absolute max and min, and if they're not, then I don't necessarily have one. That's pretty important. I think we should give a name to that theorem, and we do. It's the extreme value theorem. So if f is continuous on a closed interval, a, b, then f, two things happen, attains an absolute maximum, on AB and it attains an absolute minimum on AB. Now notice in our pictures from before sometimes that maximum occurred somewhere in between A and B and sometimes it occurred the absolute max or absolute min occurred at an endpoint. That's going to be important um, when we try to find these values. Okay, let's, let's, I'm sorry, let's go back to those graphs and let's see something else that's happening. What's happening, so we've already talked about absolute max, absolute min versus local max and local mins. And so this value right here, let's give this C, uh, x value a name, we'll call it C. We know that there is also a local max at C because, or at f of C. I'm sorry, there's a local max at C 
and it is f of c. And I know this because I can put an interval around c such that all y values on that interval sit below that y value, or f of c. And remember also that endpoints cannot be local extrema because I can't put an interval around the x value. Okay? So, if we have a local maximum or a local minimum at C, and I know the derivative exists at C, what can I say is true about that derivative? Well, I'm going to draw tangent lines at these places where they occur not at the endpoints. That one, that one, that one, that one, and even down here I'm going to draw one. So in all my local uh, max and mins, or my local extrema, if the derivative exists at that value, at that c value, then what can we say about the derivative? Well, it sure looks like the derivative at those c values, well, that c1 and that c2, and that c equals 0. That's actually also an important theorem called Fermat's theorem. So if f has a local maximum or a local minimum at c, and if f prime of c exists, then f prime of c equals 0. Now, you may wonder why that value needs to be in there, because certainly if it's a local max or a local min, then that means the derivative is 0, yes? Well, no. Remember your absolute value function. We know that, well clearly if you look at this graph, there is an absolute minimum at that point right there. We also know that the derivative doesn't exist at zero for the absolute value function. So because, so let's go back to this. We know that f has a local minimum right there um, at c, but we don't have that f prime of c exists, so we can't conclude that f prime of c equals zero. So only if it exists, so let's just make it curvy. Now the derivative exists, and now I see the tangent line equals zero.